Thanks. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Um, I think you said at the beginning that we have a, um, a, a wonderful presenter or something like that, and I, I hope uh, you haven't uh, sold, sold me too highly. Um, uh, but yes, so today um, I'm going to be talking about uh, discoveries, and I've uh, called the topic discovery is done when. Um, so how can teams ensure they're on track to deliver a discovery? So a little bit about me very quickly. Um, I'm co-head of delivery at Maytech along with Ed who introduced himself earlier. And I support our delivery community um, to enable our teams working on deliveries across public sector organizations. And you know, we've, we've worked with a lot of the people who are on the call today, um, for example, uh, um, you know, uh, from MOJ, DWP. So yeah, we, we work sort of right across the, um, the public sector. Um, before I came to Maytech, I spent many years as a delivery consultant at another agency called Valtech, where I worked on large digital transformation projects for companies such as National Rail Inquiries, EasyJet, and Just Eat. So as I alluded to, uh, Maytech are public sector technology um, sort of delivery experts. Um, we work with organizations across the public sector and have got projects in health, local government, central government, and defense. So kind of right the way across the board. So today I'm going to talk about four key areas. Firstly, a quick recap on what a GDS discovery is. Secondly, some of the challenges that I've observed um, when, when running discoveries, how an effective kickoff can really set a discovery up for success. And finally, how we've used discovery is done when objectives to successfully run discoveries. So what is meant by a GDS discovery? I won't go into too much detail here, as I'm sure this is something a lot of you are very familiar with, but just want to provide a little refresher. The Government Digital Service, or GDS, was started after a lady called Martha Lane Fox, the founder of lastminute.com, wrote a letter to the then Minister for the Cabinet Office, Francis Maud. In this letter, she called for revolution, not evolution following her review of DirectGov. And she identified that the government needed to consider digital as an enabler for public services. This letter set things in motion and resulted in the creation of GDS. The methodology that came about from this change took a lot of influence from the Lean Startup released by Eric Rice in 2008. It also took influence from the Double Diamond, released in 2004 by the British Design Council. This captured a process for defining and then working on problems. So the GDS founders took Lean Startup, took the Double Diamond, smushed it together and left us with these four stages. And these posters by Elliot Hill, which appear in the public sector offices all around the country, or at least the ones that I visited, explain it really nicely. But today, I'll just be focusing on the first stage, discoveries, or exploring the problem space. Warning, there's a potential oversimplification on, on the next slide. But in discoveries, it's all about asking ourselves, what should we do first? Too often, it can be phrased as, let's explore the problem phase, or let's find out more about user needs. And of course, that is part of it. But the other bit is really understanding what are the priorities and what should we do first? If a discovery doesn't uncover this, we'll come against a lot of problems. Alphas are then focusing on, is this service useful? Too many focus on, can we make this usable? But really, that's what we should be doing in beta. In an alpha, as quick and cheaply as possible, 
We want to work out whether we can solve the problem in a viable and impactful way. Betas are then more about making the service usable by everyone and ensure it's in, ensuring it's accessible in lots of ways. And finally, the, the, the live phase. This is all about making the service scalable and ensuring the whole population can use it. This stage process is all about reducing risk and in real terms, saving taxpayers money whilst building services that meets the needs of citizens. So why focus on discoveries? Well, in my experience, they seem to be the project that go wrong the most frequently. The short six to eight week timescale that most discoveries run in leaves little room to fix issues if they arise. For example, if user research doesn't start for three weeks due to recruitment problems, you risk being halfway through the project before you can use research findings to inform your next focus. Being told explore the problem can be pretty daunting. It often feels like a really big task and it can be a challenge to know what to prioritize first. Sometimes this can lead to delays or a slow ramp up and further exacerbate the risk of the short time frame. Unlike a digital service, where it's often easy to see when an item is completed, for example, a new form on a web service, the outputs for discovery are often more intangible. Deliverables such as service blueprints and personas may well be created, but these outputs are only valuable if they help communicate information in a way that supports decisions. This intangibility, coupled with the generative nature of a discovery, where we often prioritize what to do next based on what we've already learned, can make it hard to assess whether the team is on track. I've seen discoveries where the team, including the service owner and the product owner, have been really confident about their progress throughout the project. That is, they are confident up until the final week of the discovery, where they realize they haven't answered crucial questions that they need answers to in order to move forward into alpha. An opaqueness on progress and a lack of clarity over expectations can both lead to stakeholders being disappointed with the outputs, particularly if the product manager or service owner was unable to be fully dedicated to the discovery. So with all of these potential pitfalls, what can we do as delivery managers to maximize the chance of success? For me, I believe that the most important thing we can do is to set and agree an intention. As this diagram from Liz and Molly highlights well, success comes from taking action towards defined goals. Although some of the intention may well be defined in the business case, procurement listing or a statement of work, this may leave room for different interpretations of what good looks like. Therefore, a kickoff is imperative for building alignment in the team to help make sure everyone is clear on the expected outcome. Will Mydelton wrote a series of blog posts about discoveries that are really insightful and well worth a read. In his article, Setting Up a Discovery to Succeed with a Small Team, he talks about the importance of choosing the right goal. We've taken a lot of Will's insights and recommendations and built upon these to create our playbook for discoveries. And this has proven successful in discoveries for NHS, Camden and DLUC. And the term discovery is done when is directly taken, taken from, from Will's blogs. So when designing a discovery kickoff, we recommend dedicating a whole day to it and where possible, suggest that all team members and key stakeholders attend and clear their diary as much as possible. If feasible, in-person sessions can be particularly effective, but Google Meet or Teams 
and a virtual whiteboard such as Miro or Mural can work almost as well. We tried to keep to four sessions of 60 to 90 minutes each to maximize the amount of downtime people have between meetings in order to retain focus, absorb information and spend time getting to know one, each other, one another. This also provides opportunities to check emails and, and Slack and, and WhatsApp and whatever else you might need to check um, in between workshops so that you can really retain that focus um, when working together. During these sessions, we run workshops on team building. We set out and agree our ways of working. We'll review existing research and background information and get the product manager or service owner to talk about why, why the discovery is happening. One of the most important workshops that we'll run in the discovery is the vision and purpose setting workshop. During this workshop, we ask ourselves a series of questions based on those defined by Will Dalton and work through them together to help build up a unified picture of what good looks like. First, goals. What are things that we want to achieve by running this discovery? Assumptions. What assumptions have already been made? What things do we believe are true already that if they turned out not to be true, could cause us problems in the future. Uncovers. What are things that we wish we knew, but we don't at the moment? Rabbit holes. What should we avoid focusing on because it's likely to be a waste of time? I struggle to find a relevant picture for rabbit holes, but I've definitely wasted a lot of time playing with this dog, so it felt, uh, felt like a useful one. And finally, outputs. What outputs are we expecting to deliver? Do our stakeholders already have firm expectations about the format they, receive, they expect to receive findings in? For example, um, they really want a service blueprint that maps out the current, the as-is process or to understand the personas better. And, and it's really useful to capture those expectations up front so that we're really clear as to what good looks like. We use the answers to all the previous questions and group them together to identify themes. These themes are converted into a set of discovery is done when objectives, a list of questions that when we have the answer, we know we have completed the discovery. For example, in a DLAC discovery, one of the agreed discovery is done when objectives was Discovery is done when we know how to define and measure the benefits of the service. A useful tip is to ensure that the service owner or product owner have the deciding vote um, and that they are the ones who have overarching decision as to um, what, what the final set of discovery is done when questions should be. But as a good self-organizing agile team, we need to ensure that all team members are contributing to this and involved and feel empowered by, by the decision that's made. I'll circulate the, the deck afterwards and I've included some links to the mural and Miro templates that, that we use for this workshop. So if you do want to um, sort of take any of these ideas forward, then you can download and, and use those. So how do we use these discovery is done when objectives? You know, I've, I've worked on projects before where you run a vision, um, a, a vision session and then move on and kind of forget, you know, forget about it, set it, don't really review back to it. Well, what we found is that actually this set of discovery is done when objectives can really form the backbone of the whole discovery. We use these objectives throughout the discovery, including to plan the work, monitor progress, and structure the findings. We find that they can form a steel thread on which to hang activity planning throughout the discovery. Discovery is a process. Teams move together through understanding the problem to identifying opportunities to proposing a delivery approach. 
They open up their thinking before focusing in on an approach. And for this reason, a discovery is sometimes pictured as a diamond shape. In the first half of the diamond, in the learning phase, we ask questions such as who for and why. In the second half, we're focused on understanding the opportunity. And here we ask questions about what and when and focus on answering the question that we mentioned at the beginning, what should we do first? Considering this diamond can help us to sequence the set of discovery is done when objectives by overlaying these questions onto the three phases of the diamond. These sequence questions enable us to put together a high level discovery plan, aligning questions to iterations. Generally for a discovery, we recommend that iterations are kept short and would normally use one week sprints. This allows us to iterate our plan and priorities regularly based on what we have learned, whilst maximizing the opportunity to share findings and adapt our approaches in reviews and retros. This helps mitigate the risks associated with the short time frame of discoveries. By producing a high level roadmap where we align these objectives to the iterations, it gives us a good opportunity to ensure that our scope and team expectations are realistic. This roadmap and these questions can also support sprint planning. By making our sprint goal one or more of the agreed objectives, the whole team can self-organize their work to meet this goal. So, once we've got a plan and we're aligned on these expected outcomes, we can then use these questions to enable the team better visibility of their progress, inspecting whether we are on track to answer the agreed discovery is done when objectives within the expected timeframe. Our team introduced a weekly check-in where all team members assigned a confidence level to each discovery objective. This confidence level ranged from, we don't think we will be able to answer this, to we've got enough for the final report. Once all of the team voted, we revealed the scores and embarked on a discussion about any outliers or differences. This check-in often fed into our retrospective and our sprint plan. When questions reached a, to sort of four or five, then we started to document our findings and this meant that we could ensure that the final write-up and communication wasn't left until the very end, but instead we were capturing our learnings and recommendations throughout the project. We plotted the total scores for each question over time to provide a visual representation of our progress towards our objectives. This really helped us to visualize any risks or issues. For example, slow progress on a question and provided an opportunity to have conversations about support needed to unblock the team. It also helped us to facilitate conversations about reprioritizing objectives where needed. I've also included links to the templates that we use for this again in, in my Rowan mural. And finally, once you've done all of this great work, sort of going out and speaking to users and looking at the existing systems and reviewing the marketplace and whatever else it is that you, that you have to do to, to answer the questions that you set out, well, we find that using these answers, um, oh, sorry, answering these questions is, is no use if you can't effectively communicate your findings to stakeholders and decision makers. And one thing that's shown to be really useful is actually using these discovery is done when objectives um, to provide a common language that you can keep referring to. For example, during show and tells, they can be structured around the objective that you've been prioritizing. It also is helpful to share the progress over time scores and the graph that I sort of showed a few slides ago so that stakeholders can understand how the team is progressing and also sort of get bought into why they might need to come and help unblock something. And in the final report, recommendations can similarly be structured around these objectives. 
helping set out clearly the answers to the questions we set out to discover at the beginning. So key takeaways. A well-planned and effective kickoff is crucial for team alignment. Agreeing a set of discovery is done when objectives provides teams a common language and a vision for what good looks like. These objectives provide a stale thread for project and sprint planning. Having the team self-assess confidence in answering these objectives provides a tool to quantify progress. This enables earlier identification of potential problems and blockers. And these objectives can provide a useful way to structure finding playbacks. Thanks. I'm aware I finished quite early, so apologies for that. Uh, but hopefully we can fill the time with some questions. Maybe let's unmute. Let's everybody just unmute and let's have a big round of applause. Can I ask you all to do that? Just everybody just unmute yourselves. We've got to 100 people watching that. So. Thanks, Laura. Questions then. Come on, group. What, what are you thinking? What are your questions for Laura? Ken, you've got your hand up. I think you were first. Go for it. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Thanks for the presentation. It's really good. Thank you. Um, do you ever see a situation where the way the team sets out its stall for discovery blurs into solutionizing or into the kind of more alpha-like outputs? Yes, I've definitely seen that. Um, but I guess in a way I would sort of expect us to towards the end of it to be solutionizing a little bit, like not fully going down a um, you know a, a complete solution, but we might use sort of a, a how might we um, workshop and start looking at here are all of the problem statements that we've um, discovered um, from our users, from the existing system, from the from the business. Well, how might we solve these um, problems? And from that, we can then start to produce, you know, a few hypotheses and hopefully one overarching hypothesis that can be taken into Alpha, um, so that you can then start to test test that hypothesis. Thank you. Jill, I think you're top of the pile at the minute. Oh, well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Laura, that was brilliant. That was really, really, oh, sorry. Um, can you still hear me? We can. Yeah, I sat on the, uh, my little thingy, which isn't great. So I need to move that out of the way of my bum. Um, <laughs> um, that was really, really useful and lovely and clear and just super helpful um i'm thinking that type of um guide and a uh, very clear walkthrough of how to approach a discovery would be incredibly helpful for new dms um definitely within the department for education um i was just wondering whether you have a similar um approach um for the other phases of delivery as well so the alpha the beta etc good question um, not yet uh, is the the honest answer. I think we have uh, generative kind of approaches and and sort of uh, best practices, but not in a, a set out sort of playback and set of templates yet. Thank you. Yeah, I, I guess the uh, the follow up I'd add is we sort of prioritised where we saw the biggest challenges, and as sort of as I mentioned at the beginning, I think discovery is often ones where. Um, it's harder to course correct if, if they yeah. start to go off track. Cool, thank you. Sarah, Sarah, Santia, Pillai. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Great, thank you. Um, so I have a question for uh, yourself, Laura, and also, um, I guess, the the group. Um, I I just wanted to know, because obviously um, the GDS websites, um, they do actually say the most pivotal roles that you need in the discovery are product managers, user researchers, um, service designers, if you can get them. And um, my question is, 
do we as a community feel that having a DM as part of the discovery is still of value um, or do we think it's val- you know value add to bring them in later and um, I can just say from my own experience um, I've been a discover- uh, DM on many discoveries and I've you know, I've definitely found a lot of things useful, but I do wonder if it means that the DM sometimes ends up taking a bit more accountability of kind of delivery of those user needs and and the discovery outcomes. Um, and maybe that should sit with other roles. So just a genuine question. And also to say thank you very much. The presentation was great. Yeah, I was trying to rapidly uh, find another document in the background. So apologies. Um, but yes, um, I've, I've, I might actually add it um, to it when I circulate it around. We sort of talked about what the different um, different roles are in a discovery and what um, people could do. I can't find it, but I will circulate it. Um, but one of the things I think we have said is that you might not need a delivery manager. Like maybe if you have a product manager who is fully embedded in the team, who's happy to kind of support that overarching um, like direction, then you might not need a full delivery management or maybe some support there. Um, I think the other thing that I think is useful as a delivery manager is you kind of have one foot in discovery and one foot in alpha. And so starting to think about, you know, helping the product manager build those costings, for example. You know, if you want to put a business case together for moving into an alpha and a beta, then like working with a product manager on, on that. But um, yeah, I, I, think, I think I'm waffling here slightly, sorry. Um, but I think I'm quite a big believer personally in sort of T-shaped people and um, sort of making sure you have responsibilities covered, but not necessarily roles if that makes sense so keeping a team small um particularly in discoveries you can really share those learnings i think is 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 vital and that might mean that you have one person covering a couple of roles when they're happy um but yeah i, I guess flex depending on the complexity and, and what's needed thank you greg We've got you and then we'll come to Louis' question in the chat. Laura can't see the chat. I think that's right, isn't it, Laura? So, yeah, please do unmute if you can. But I'll I'll read yours out, Louis. Greg, I, go I'm, for it. I'm going to apologise and say I'm breaking the rules here. And I, it's not a question, it's more just me saying I agree with Laura. Um, and we've never met before. Our uh, experiences are presumably different because we've never worked together. Um, but yes, one week sprints and yes, having having sprints, having that structure, really, really important, making sure, I, I'm trying to remember whether you mentioned Scrum, maybe you didn't, but actually it's a really good thing, I think, to have a delivery manager there, being a bit T-shaped, but giving that structure to a team, because it, it, in the same way that a spike is, it should not be um, kind of unstructured engineer playtime, a discovery should not be for a team to kind of go off in many, many directions all at once. You, definitely need that direction and and to address that every single week or every single sprint so yeah I just want to shout out about that and it was great that it, we'd agreed with each other without having spoken uh, spoken to each other thanks greg um i was quite careful to refer to iterations rather than sprints because i try not to be too dogmatic and Generally, I think when a team is high performing and kind of moving into, you know, into, into beta, actually like Kanban, for example, can be really great. I think often discoveries and new teams coming together. And so actually having a little bit of structure and a, and a cadence can be really useful for, for helping kind of avoid that, I guess, like analysis paralysis. Yeah, and embracing that uncertainty that you start off on day one, and you, you just don't know, you don't know where you're aiming for in X week's time. Uh, and that you have learned things over a given period of time. And, and actually, that's going to give you other leads to go on. There's a question in the chat from Louis. Louis, all good. Laura, I'm curious to hear what you think about discovery service assessments slash peer reviews. And then it's a smiley face that looks a bit like this sort of like a middle smiley face. My org doesn't do them, nor have I observed one, but have heard mixed views about them. Sorry, his Wi-Fi is horrendous. He would have asked it himself. 
Oh, really good question. Um, and I remember having a conversation with like Katie Armstrong about this, um, who was head of delivery at DLUC at the time. And I think she was, from memory, was quite pro them, although maybe she's on the call and will be able to argue. Um, but yeah, I think, I guess in a way, a business case often forms part of that um, that kind of stage gate. So, you know, often the discovery is is putting together something to, to make a recommendation to go forward. Um, I don't know whether a full assessment would make sense, but I think peer review um, is always really helpful in anything that you're you're doing. And um, you know, in a discovery where maybe you have got quite a small team. Um, having somebody else come in and take a look and say, well, have you thought about this thing? Um, preferably like not just at the end of the discovery, but maybe on like semi-regular points and perhaps you can use a, a review for that would be, would be helpful. Um, and the other thing that I, I kind of like to think about is doing just enough, like keeping a discovery quite lean, like you don't need to discover everything. You don't need to have answered every single question. You need to have discovered just enough to kind of move forward into alpha. And I think um, I'm not a user research professional, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure they could talk about it better than I can. But, you know, I think what people say and what people do aren't always the same things. So the quicker you can get like a prototype into somebody's hands and do some, you know, do some actual testing, like that's when you you discover loads more. Um, so I think what we tend to recommend our teams do is, you know, keep discovering throughout alpha and into beta and don't treat it as like a waterfall thing where we have to know everything up front and design everything. So I guess if you were to add in an assessment, it could be at risk of trying to do everything up front and maybe kind of bloating that phase a little bit. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. So we're, we're trying up a little bit there. There's, there is one announcement that somebody has asked me to kind of put out. So this is from a lady called Lindsay Baker, and she works for the Central Digital and Data Office. And I'm, I'm just going to put it in the chat. Um, hopefully people can get that. So they are looking to um, to build a common digital brand identity in government and they're keen to reach out to members of the delivery community. So there's a bunch of sessions going on there. Feel free to have a look at that. I'll put it in CrossGov Slack as well. Um, so that's that's kind of final announcement. But we've got I mean, we've got 15 minutes. We've got loads of time, absolutely loads of time. Um, so just open that floor again for more questions. Somebody put their hand up. I didn't see who it was, but then took it down if if they want to come in. Um, thanks, Stephen. It was me. Um, I, I've been around the blocks in government and GDS for years. And I used to be part of the assessment team in both GDS and the Home Office. Um, Laura, great presentation, by the way. The assessments proved very useful because what we would do is explain to the team what we we're hoping that they would have at the end of the discovery. And then we'd parachute a few people in to help them deliver. So we'd, if, if they weren't good at a certain part of it, we'd say, look, we'll, we'll lend you Bill or Stephanie or Ted. They'd work with the team during the discovery. And at the end, we'd come in, assess them and say, great job, fantastic, carry on, your alpha is ready to go. Or pull them up and say, look, nearly there, a couple more weeks would be really helpful. Unfortunately, the assessments turned into some kind of um, headmaster wrapping the head, you know, the cane on the table and saying, you have not done well, everyone here. I think it'd be nice to kind of think about rejuvenating them because in my last year in government, I'm finding that no one's doing assessments anymore and there's a lot of really dodgy projects being given permission to proceed. And I think we could save the taxpayer a few pounds by maybe just bringing back a bit of gentle rigour or diligence there. Yeah, I think, I think, I think of Ian, just to come back, I think in DWP, I think we've gone the other way. We are going over the top with our assessments. So I've got some DWP colleagues on the call. We've got an internal assessment team and we've got the CDDO assessment team and we do both. That's interesting. 
So that's kind of like gone the other way um, far too much. Because the, the assessment fear. team at the assessment team in home office used to want every team to succeed. They didn't want to shut them down or slap them on the wrist. They wanted them to succeed and be, be great. So they'd put all of their resources in into that team in the discovery phase if they needed it to say, just, just a reminder, you need to have good user research. You need to think, double check the problem, make sure your, your, your metrics are going to work, make sure your tooling has been chosen to, to make everyone shine. And it used to be a really nice process, but I think it's turned into a grumpy old, you know, no, 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 no type thing. Can't disagree with you there. I was going to say, I think the other thing that, you know, didn't really cover here, but a, a good outcome of a discovery might be a decision not to proceed. And I think it can be really hard um, sort of as a team to to make that decision and to I, I think you kind of feel um like it's almost a bit like the, sh the sunken ship fallacy of that well we've put loads of time into this so we want to to move forward um and I do wonder whether having some sort of assessment would would help with that um but yeah that's just random thoughts go for it Dan um, I've put a note in chat if you prefer reading, but basically I work in an org, um, the hydrographic office down in uh, Taunton, um, and we don't have to follow the service standard. So we all of our work generally goes on Admiralty. We're basically a commercial organisation um, with a few kind of central government aspects to it. Um, and as such, we followed our kind of own internal governance um, and over the last year I've worked as part of a team to um, update our governance um, and kind of take in what learnings we can from the service standards so we're now a lot more aligned with the phases um, we never used to really make conscious decisions to move between the phases was one of the things we found so we've now pushed that into our governance to make sure that whatever you are doing to move out of your discovery phase, you have to be conscious of the fact that you are moving out of your discovery phase. Um, that sounds daft, but we never did it before as an organisation. Um, and another thing that we are trying at the moment is basically the assessment model, um, but done on a more risk but or sort of um, risk or uh, impact basis so that if there is a you know we're a bit unsure about this or this has a huge impact on the organization or our users or safety of lives at sea and the things we really care about then we might put in that kind of assessment because it's really important that we do make sure we're doing the right things you know all the time or that we're you know this is such new territory that really we need to think about it so that's kind of where we're going still very much a work in progress um but yeah i just thought i'd give a bit of a idea from someone that doesn't have to follow the service standard per se Looks like we're trying up there, doesn't it? Cool. Well, I mean, maybe let's just all put our cameras on to finish and just like wave. Um, I really enjoyed that bit at the start. Just wave at everybody and say thanks very much, Laura. And then let's let's go. Oh, Barry's here. Lovely. Just nice. joined as Laura was saying, and that's that's finished. Brilliant. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Yeah. Thanks, Laura.